Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My guest today is Arnie Gunderson, an old friend, an energy advisor with Fairwinds Associates, a company which provided research, analysis and paralegal services around environmental and energy issues and still does. Arnie Gunderson has a 39-year history of nuclear power engineering experience and during his nuclear industry career, Arnie managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants around the US. He currently speaks on television, radio and at public meetings on the need for a new paradigm in energy production. An independent nuclear engineering and safety expert, Arnie provides testimony on nuclear operations, reliability, safety and ra radiation issues to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the US, congressional and state legislatures and government agencies and officials throughout the US Canada and internationally. Arnie Gunderson, welcome again to If You Love This Planet. Hi Helen, thank you for having me. Now Arnie, as we know the Fukushima drama disaster continues apace. Will you please give us an update on where everything is at this particular point in time? Uh, sure, Let, let's start right on the site. Um, Tokyo Electric released a report this week that says that if there was a, uh, a strong earthquake or, um, or another tsunami, um, they, uh, the piping that they put in to keep the reactors cool is, uh, is, is really not capable of withstanding an earthquake or a tsunami. And uh, they estimate that it would be about 38 hours before they would have meltdowns. So, oh, really? That's, that's another meltdown? Yes. You know, there's still that decay heat, and there will be decay heat. After the nuclear fission has stopped, there's still radioactive material in the core, and it's radioactively hot, but it's also physically hot. And uh, T Tokyo Electric has done the calculations, and they show that they would have less than two days to get the piping back and working again, or else they'd have um, more of a meltdown. They could not cool the core, and uh, whatever hasn't melted down would. So I thought, you know, that's an indication that um, um, it, it is still a dangerous place to be. Things are very tenuous, aren't they? Yes. So that's the, the three units that have nuclear fuel in the core, Unit 1, Unit 2, and Unit 3, um, that applies to. On Unit 1, there's some good news. They, they were able to put the, it looks like a substantial building, but actually it's a tent um, over top of the... Uh, the reactor building. Tent made of and, plastic, um, isn't it? Isn't it a plastic yes. tent? <laughs> yes, it's made of plastic. And um, they did it with remotely controlled cranes so that it was so radioactive they didn't want to get people, um, uh, uh, give people a high dose. And they um, uh, built this tent over the top of the entire uh, unit, unit one. Now what that does is they can then connect it to the stack and instead of releasing the radioactivity at the ground level, they'll run it up through filters and then up the stack. They're not there yet, but they're, um, uh, they're close to having the stack connected. So what good That's, is that, for God's sake? I mean, the radiation is still getting out into the environment. It's going up the stack a bit higher to be um, deposited far and wide over Japan. I, ca I can't understand why that's a good thing. Why would they do that? Before it, it does, um, you know, dispersion is the solution to pollution. No, it's like not. That. Dilution, <laughs> the solution to pollution by dilution when it comes to radiation is fallacious because it lands on the soil and reconcentrates in the food chain. So, what? The other thing they're doing, though, Helen, is uh, to give them credit, uh, they are running that through a filter first. Oh. So instead of it being unfiltered, they will filter it and then what... What gets through the filter now will go up the stack as opposed to be uh, via ground level. Well, what, what, it doesn't make the, what isotopes can they filter out then with the filter? Uh, depends on the size of the particle. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these particles are, um, are quite small. Uh -huh. um, at best, they'll get 90% of them, but that's not bad. Um, if the particle size is very small, it will go right through the filter. So that's still part of the ongoing science project we call Fukushima. It doesn't stop the liquid either. The, the liquid releases are, uh, 
again becoming um, very problematic. And I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Unit 2 and Unit 3, um, pretty much the same. Gases, radioactive gases and radioactive steam are leaking out of the building. And what that says is that somewhere the containment is broken. Um, there, there should be, if the containments were functional, you shouldn't see steam coming out of those plants, even though the building around it, that's called the reactor building, even though the reactor building is damaged. But uh, it's obvious the containments have been broken and um, uh, steam is, is exiting. That shouldn't happen. To get to the liquids, though, um, what the problem is they're, they're generating more and more and more very radioactive liquids. The, the, what's happened is they put in a system to filter the radioactive liquid, then they pump it back into the nuclear reactor, and it runs onto the floor, and then they collect it and they filter it, and it runs back into the plant. And that was supposed to reduce the amount of water that they had on site, or at least not make it get any worse. But what they found is that something on the order of 400 tons a day of water are leaking into the building. So from groundwater and from rain and from cracks in the building, not only do they have the water that they deliberately put there, but they also have 400 tons a day that's leaking in. So now they've got almost no place to store the water on site. They're cutting down a forest on site, and they're putting more and more tanks in so that they have a place to store all this radioactive water. That's going to continue for, for months, if not a year or more, until the cooling of the core becomes, uh, becomes easier. Their, their biggest problem, if they don't have an earthquake, their biggest problem is managing this water. Getting down to Unit 4, um, Unit 4 has been pretty thoroughly braced. Um, they, they sent people in and put braces underneath the nuclear fuel pool uh, because they, like I, were very worried that in an earthquake the building would collapse. It's, um, it's better now, but if there was a severe quake, the, the most dangerous thing on the site is the fuel pool for Unit 4. So things are stable. Um, the radiation releases are much lower than they were you know, back when the accident started. Um, but they're still precarious if, um, if Mother Nature decides to get angry again. Um, Arnie, you said that Building 4, yeah, they've braced the pool to make the pool more stable, but that the building itself is still quite precarious. And you said that if there was another earthquake, it's possible that Building 4 could collapse with the cooling pool on top of it. Is that still accurate or not? Yes, that's absolutely accurate. And I... I have told my friends in Japan, if there's an earthquake that knocks over Building 4, uh, get out of Dodge because it's not, um, it, it's not a place um, you would want to be. It is, no science has ever been developed to, to calculate what radioactive material lying on the ground outside the power plant uh, could conceivably do. The Brookhaven study back in 98 estimated that a fire in a fuel pool like Unit 4 uh, could kill 186,000 people. So it, it's clearly, you know, um, let's pray there's no earthquake, uh, but uh, a big earthquake. Um, but it's clearly the biggest danger on site right now. Okay, now the next question is, to filter the water and to filter the air coming out of Unit 1 from the plastic tent, what, what do they use for filters? What's the material A and B? What do the filters trap in terms of a specific isotopes? And C, what do they do with these incredibly toxic radioactive filters? And how long do they last? Well, the radioactive filters collect um, predominantly cesium, uh, but also the strontium and any other radioactivity, cobalt-60 and things like that. And you're absolutely right. Very quickly they become the most highly radioactive filters that anyone in the industry has ever dealt with. Now, these are from a design that the French use on their reprocessing plant. Um, essentially, you're dealing with reprocessed nuclear fuel in these filters. They're also going to have plutonium in them and, um, because the, the fuel is now lying in the bottom of the containment buildings there's water over the top, and, and um, the contamination will also include plutonium. So I think they have to be stored on site 
until the Japanese come up with a long-term geologic repository for the nuclear fuel. And that's, you know, they're 20 years away from being able to peel off the uh, nuclear fuel from the floor in the turbine build in the, in the containment building. So uh, they have a serious long-term storage problem for the filters, um, and um, we'll need a special, um, very well-shielded building to make sure that that radioactive material doesn't um, doesn't get so radioactive that um, it would be impossible to, to get near it on site. Um, well, TEPCO apparently today, just a few hours ago, Arnie Gunderson, came out with a statement saying it's going to take 30 years for them to clean up this mess. That was just a few hours ago that TEPCO made that announcement. It doesn't surprise me. You know, and, and the, the problem is um, if they had attacked it early on with ferocity nationwide, they might have had an, an easier time cleaning it up than they have now. Um, we have this game called Whack-A-Mole here in the in the U.S., and you can imagine seven or eight holes, and this mole sticks its head up, and you try to hit the mole. And oh, Whack-A-Mole, mole that's a horrible, that's horrible, honey. <laughs> well, you try to hit the mole, and he jumps down, and he pops up in another hole, and then you hit that hole, and he jumps up in another hole. Um, that's what's happening in Japan right now. Because they don't have a process that, that systematically went at the radiation, they are... Um, uh, they're struggling because they'll attack it where it pops up, and then they'll go attack it where it pops up. And the, the process is cheap, and Tokyo Electric is um, really unwilling to spend what it's going to take to clean up. But I think because they're trying to minimize their costs now, they're actually going to make the problem more costly and more time-consuming in the future. It doesn't surprise me that they said 30 years. I've been saying 20 all along. Um, there, there's no technology to deal with removing the nuclear fuel from these buildings. The melted fuel, Island, melted fuel. Melted nuclear fuel from these buildings. Now, Three Mile Island has melted nuclear fuel, but it all stayed in the nuclear reactor vessel. Mm. And what they could do then is flood the nuclear reactor vessel and go in and, with tools, remove the nuclear fuel. Well, here, they can't flood the nuclear reactor vessel because it's leaking. Mm. It's leaking in several places. And so in order to flood the nuclear reactor, they have to flood the whole containment. And that becomes a, a, a structural problem. This building was never meant to hold that much water and uh, in an earthquake or, or just general issues. Um, it, it, it could collapse. So... Uh, they need an entire new approach to get enough water in to shield the people to remove the fuel. And then it's lying like a, a pancake on the bottom. You know, uh, when you overcook a pancake in a frying pan, how mm. hard it is to peel the pancake off the frying pan. Yeah. It's, it's going to be like that on the floor of the nuclear reactor. So it's not going to give up easily. Well, and, and I mentioned to you recently that, you know, they said, by the end of the year, the three units will be in cold shutdown. But you said that's not true because cold shutdown means that the fuel is still in the reactor core in a, in a geometrical design um, as it was originally designed to be. But this is like a <coughs> molten pancake, excuse me, on the bottom of the uh, containment vessel. So you, you, you would deny that these three reactors are in cold shutdown, right, Arnie? That's right. That was a great explanation, by the way. The, the, um, the concept of, of a cold shutdown means that the nuclear reactor is actually containing the nuclear fuel, which isn't the case here. And Now, they may hold the water at less than uh, 100 degrees centigrade, but that doesn't mean that the fuel, because it's in a big lump on the bottom of the, uh, of the reactor, is going to be at 100 degrees. And the concept of, of cold shutdown really means that the entire system uh. is at 100 degrees. And because this is a big lump somewhere in the core, the core is in the, the reactor or on the floor outside the reactor, that concept is, um, uh, it sounds nice, but really it's a meaningless concept. Yeah, and, and the, the lump is about 100 tons, is it? Um, at least 100 tons, yeah. 